Welcome. Welcome to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions known as ISPS. We would like to take this opportunity to thank you for joining our program on sea level rise and resiliency measures. Before we begin, I would like to share the mission and the purpose of ISPS. ISPS is the brainchild of Congressman Bill Young. Congressman Young sought to create a community where you could educate people at the local, regional, state, and national level on the scope of government. It was his vision to create a think tank that provided a forum for nonpartisan discussion on social, political, and economic issues. We invite you to learn more about our program on our Facebook page and website. If you're interested in learning how you can contribute, we certainly welcome your feedback and we enjoy having the community participate. I would like to thank our panelists for joining us today for this most important conversation on the impact of sea level rise and on the impact of resiliency measures. As an area that lives on a, sea, on a coastal area, it is our obligation to learn more and educate ourselves about the impact of our footprint. Our first speaker is Dr. Davina Passeri. She is a research oceanographer at the U.S. Geological Survey in St. Petersburg Coastal Marine Center. Her research is focused on using computer models to understand how hazards such as hurricanes and future sea level rise will impact coastal environments and what strategies can help mitigate the effects. Our next panelist is Patrick Luce. Patrick Luce is an adjunct economics professor at St. Petersburg College and is a consultant with an engineering and planning firm called Stantic. He helps local governments with financial and economic analysis, and I'm sure you enjoy his robust conversation. Finally, I'd like to introduce Christian Moriarty. He is a professor of ethics and law and in the academic chair of Applied Ethics Institute at St. Petersburg College with the College of Public Policy, Ethics, and Legal Studies. He enjoys good policy debate on important issue and topics. And because of his love for speaking, we are asking him to moderate this most important debate. Again, I wanna thank you for joining us and taking your evening to participate in this conversation. If you have any questions, I'd like to remind you that you have a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You should be able to put any questions you have there. We will do our very best to answer them in kind. Please note that some of the questions we will not be able to verbally respond to. However, we will have our panelists respond to them in the Q&A section. Also, we are in the Tampa Bay region in St. Petersburg, Clearwater and around the area and there's a storm brewing. If we lose, connect, lose connection at all, we just ask for your patience as we continue this program. Thank you and Christian, take it away. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. I appreciate it. Uh, welcome all to our, this fascinating debate about re resilience and a conversation on how we as a society, country, and world can move forward in maintaining uh, the, the most we can in our cities and our towns and uh, our culture that comes along, along with it. So what we're going to be doing is that we're going to be having uh, some initial presentations from the three panelists, including myself at the end. Uh, and afterwards, we'll be taking your questions using the Q&A function here at the bottom of your screen. I'm pointing to it. I think that means you can see it, right? Uh, so uh, if you have any questions uh, as we're talking about this and you want to get them down into the Q&A, uh, don't hesitate to go ahead and use them right away. Uh, if you want to ask your question to a specific panelist, make sure you uh, point out who you want to direct it to. And uh, as Dr. Jackson mentioned, we probably won't get to all of your questions, but we'll do as best as we can. All right, so uh, let's start with our first panelist, Dr. Uh, Passeri, were you ready to go? I'm ready. Let's do it. All right, well, thank you, Kimberly, for the introduction. Thank you, Christian, and thank you all for having me here today on this panel. I'm excited that we got to go through with this, even if it's done virtually. I've been studying the effects of sea level rise for just over 10 years now, and I've really noticed that there is a shift in the interest and the perception of climate change and sea level rise in particular. More people seem to be paying attention to the issue of sea level rise, and they want to know how it's going to affect their communities. 
So I thought that the documentary Sinking Cities Miami was really well done. Um, it explained the issue of sea level rise very clearly, and it brought up some of the strategies that Miami is using to help mitigate these effects. So a lot of these points are relative to us, and we can think about them as we face the reality of sea level rise here in the Tampa Bay region. So the documentary really focused on the effects of sea level rise from an inundation point of view, but it's important to recognize that the coast is not going to respond like a bathtub to sea level rise, meaning that we're not just going to have higher water levels that inundate our present day shorelines, but instead these higher water levels are going to allow waves to act further on the coastline. And so in addition to seeing increased flooding during tide and storm events, we're also going to see things like increased beach erosion and wetland loss. And so these changes to our coastal environments like beaches and estuaries will have impact to our coastal communities. Both beaches and estuaries act as a first line of defense during storm events to help protect coastal communities by dampening wave energy and reducing storm surge inundation. And alongside of the human communities, we also have ecological habitats that live in these environments. Um, both beaches and estuaries provide habitats for species like shorebirds, beach mice, alligators, and fish. And so when we think about the effects of sea level rise, we can see that there's going to be both an economic impact, but also an ecologic impact. The documentary also discussed some of the strategies that Miami is implementing to help mitigate the effects of sea level rise. So one thing they talked about were the use of seawalls, which are uh, what we call hard structures. Other examples of hard structures are jetties and breakwaters. But a lot of times there's disadvantages to these hard structures. So seawalls and jetties in particular can cause um, the disruption of sand movement along the shoreline and actually result in more erosion to nearby areas. And so there's been this push to move away from these hard structures and use what are called natural and nature-based features. Examples of these are restoring dunes on beaches, um, putting more sand on the beach through beach nourishment projects, and restoring marshes, seagrass beds, and oyster reefs. And the outcome of these natural and nature-based features are to help dampen wave energy, to stabilize shorelines, and also to reduce storm surge inundation. Lastly, I think that the documentary had a little bit of a cynical view but Miami is actually one of the only cities in Florida um, that not only acknowledges that sea level rise is happening, but has an active plan in place for how to mitigate the effects of sea level rise. And so as we think about sea level rise and what it means for Tampa Bay, well, we have critical infrastructure that sits right on the coast. Examples are MacDill Air Force Base and Tampa General Hospital. Both Tampa and St. Pete are undergoing this renaissance, so there's rapid expansion and a lot of money being invested into new development. Last year, the Tampa Climate Science Advisory Panel put out a report with recommendations for which sea level rise scenarios to consider for planning purposes. And so if you look at that bottom middle figure here, you can see that Tampa Bay can expect anywhere from two to eight feet of sea level rise by the year 2100. But we can't just think about the effects of sea level rise as something that are happening in the future. We're seeing these effects of sea level rise happening now. So Tampa Bay has been really fortunate. We haven't um, been hit by a hurricane directly for a very long time but we still experience the effects of storms. So if you look at the upper right image there, that was taken at Sunset Beach as a storm passed by the coast. And you can see that the water levels were all the way up um, to the dune line. So that particular event caused some significant beach erosion. 
The bottom right image was taken at Coffee Pot Bayou in downtown St. Pete. And so this was um, an example of the sunny day or nuisance flooding. This was a strong wind event that pushed the high tide water levels onto the roadway. And so as we're investing more money into our city and there's more human lives at stake, we have to think about coastal resilience as a necessity rather than an option. And so I'll leave you um, with this quote. It's a popular climate science motto. The sea level is rising. The best we can do now is to manage the unavoidable and avoid the unmanageable. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Passeri. That's such important uh, information that will give us the, the context for this conversation. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Lutz, are you ready to go? Yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's do it. Go on ahead. Excellent. And thank you all, Dr. Passeri. That was excellent. Um, that is totally outside of my realm of thinking. And so what I hope to do is layer in a little bit of uh, economic context and just understand how um, we can kind of package up a lot of these solutions that uh, we've just talked about uh, in place to help mitigate sea level rise and abate stormwater and, and how this impacts our daily lives and how this impacts our decision making um, from the, the public sector and our own private lives. And so what I wanted to do is just kind of layer in how we, you know, conceptualize resiliency planning, because that's what we're trying to do is we're understanding that there's a challenge in front of us and we need some plan in place to start fixing it. And this is really maintained at the local level, uh, specific with Miami, but in other coastal regions of Florida, where this is becoming a heavy topic of discussion in the public forum. And so what we want to do then is understand how local governments will then come into play and have a role with the provision of resiliency planning and helping us abate these uh, impacts that arise from sea level rise. And finally, just want to focus more so on the impacts to our daily lives and why this is uh, so important from an economic standpoint. And so what I want to do is just take a big step backwards and, and help articulate why it is that the government needs to be involved in this. And so in economics, we have a classification system or a little matrix that I've popped up on the screen to help us identify different types of goods and services. You know, most goods and services are uh, what we would call rival and excludable, and we quantify those as private goods. And so a good that's excludable just effectively means that it's possible to prevent a person from enjoying its benefits. And a good that is rival is effectively a good service or a resource that if one person uses it, it decreases the quantity available to someone else. Most goods fall into this category. Now what we're focusing on is the resiliency planning that takes place to help abate you know, these king tide events and even just the impacts of sea level rise. And this is what we'll call as you know, non-rival and non-excludable effectively it's impossible to prevent a person from benefiting from all these measures that the city of Miami or uh, Pinellas County are taking. At the same time, it's non-rival because if one person benefits from the use of you know, new uh, backflow prevention systems uh, to help push back the, the sea water life rise, we're not going to impact anyone else's use of it. So this is why we get into this region where we have this public good that then needs provision by the government in order to help us make sure that we have a good plan in place. And so with these public goods, we have the free rider problem. And effectively, I have a little picture up here that shows all the contributors or would be contributors who help pay for sea level rise abatement and resiliency planning. However, we can't prevent the free rider from enjoying all the benefits that you receive from resili resiliency planning. So effectively, we need to have a mechanism in place that we have equity in our economy. We have a equal share of costs being derived based upon the benefit that everyone receives and we avoid the free rider problem. And so we then start to think about, well, how, how do we define how big our resiliency plan is, right? We could spend infinite amounts of dollars and make sure that we have no impact at all. 
but our decision making process really involves this cost benefit analysis. And so we have public engagement that help local uh, officials and our local governments understand the benefits that we receive from you know, non-flooded roads. And so we wanna make sure that we have a good grasp and understanding of our marginal costs, right? The costs associated with the enhanced performance-based design measures relative to the benefits that we receive. And so ultimately we wanna make sure that we target you know, the biggest bang for buck right, effectively what gets us our most benefit relative to our lowest cost. And we'll continue to make these decisions until we're at a point where our cost equals our benefit. And so what I wanna to transition to then is what's currently being done and how this is being provided by the city of Miami and what they're doing as part of their resiliency planning, again, to help abate the impacts of sea level rise. And so just looking through their current government planning, they have a stormwater master plan. And this was conducted in 2012. And what it does is it goes and conceptualizes and has a lot of engineers and planners coming into place to understand how we can best maximize a resiliency plan based upon capital infrastructure improvements. And so a new update to that study is ongoing right now that is seeking out to help sustain or help improve the city stormwater plan uh, and with a goal of you know, 40 to 50 years out. With that said, currently what's being done based upon prior studies, prior master plans is about $46.5 million of spending over the next five years just for storm sewers. And finally, what the city of Miami done has issued a general obligation bond. And what this will do is effectively allocate dollars, proceeds to different initiatives. And of that $400 million, $192 million are allocated to uh, the abatement of sea level rise, right? Sea level mitigation, as well as flood prevention. And so these are huge dollar amounts and we need to understand the economic impacts of that to our daily lives and who pays and how they pay for it. And so there's several mechanisms in place to recover the costs of these different types of programs. And so what we typically see are using property taxes. And what this will do is have a annual tax rate based upon your property value and the millage rate. And this will collect revenue at the city level and then disperse it amongst all of the different initiatives that the city has, whether it's uh, their transportation network, their police services, their stormwater system. And so this is one general pot of money. Now what we've seen, especially in the state of Florida and within our coastal regions, is finding more designated funding sources. And so the first one, or the middle one right there is assessments. And so effectively what an assessment will do is create an annual non ad valorem tax that's based upon the cost and benefit drivers relative to a specific property. And the next one is a utility bill that can be done monthly or bi-monthly or even quarterly, again, based upon the specific property costs and benefit drivers. And what we wanna do when we're trying to understand the dollar amounts associated with these programs, these resiliency plans, is we wanna make sure that those who benefit from these programs are paying the cost. And so with the property taxes and assessments, those are property owners paying those costs. Whereas the utility bill is the property tenant who could be the owner or could also be a renter. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to understand is some equal basis that's equitable. And what we mean by equity is this cost benefit nexus is maintained. And so there's a couple of ways that we can think about that. One is through the idea of impervious area and the amount of stormwater runoff that you have. And the other is based upon the amount of trips that your property generates, right? Having clear roadways and road networks without floods. And so those are a couple of ways that we think about allocating costs based on those benefits that we receive. And the reason why we do this all is because we wanna help protect our local economy, right? We wanna make sure that these impacts aren't preventing all the economic activity that goes on. And so I just brought to, to this slide some high level statistics in Miami-Dade County alone. 
And so there's 100 or 1.15 million people who are employed by Miami-Dade County, which equates to about 12% of all of Florida employment. And so these are jobs that need to be protected to make sure that we have a, a well-running local economy. And of that employment, they're generating about $146 billion worth of gross domestic product. And this is just the value of all the goods and services that are produced within Miami-Dade County. And lastly, just the other statistic I threw up there is just our medium home values and our, our property values. And effectively, if we become a city that allows flooding that doesn't take initiatives and measures to avoid it, well, we're gonna significantly reduce those home values. And so we're just trying to make sure we're doing the right things to protect our economy. Awesome. Thank you both for uh, all of that really useful information. Uh, what I'm going to attempt to do for this next piece is to talk about some ethics and policy that's uh, related to all of this. Um, one thing is that we have uh, the economics, we have the, 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 uh, the science, but then what, what do we do? What, 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 what are the solutions? How, how do we move forward with all of this? One of the, the things that the documentary discussed was that uh, there's going to be two feet of sea rise in Miami uh, by 2060. So that's in, if I'm doing my math right, 40 years. Uh, that means downtown and the beach areas will be below sea level in 40 years. Uh, and then even worse, that by 2100 in 80 years, uh, there will be six feet of sea rise, uh, as Dr. Passeri also discussed, it's a, a, a huge amount. And she, as she discussed, there might be eight feet in our local area. So what does that mean for the rest of us? How do we then uh, deal with these, uh, uh, these problems? As uh, Professor Luch went over, is that we have some economic drivers, but we also have to make sure that we're doing that in the right way, in the most ethical way. So. One thing that the movie and the documentary went over was the issues of vulnerable displacement. Is that well, one thing that's, if you can call it a silver lining, is that a lot of the real estate, a lot of the homes in Miami that have, uh, that are uh, gonna have a potential issue with sea level rise uh, are very expensive real estate owned by relatively wealthy people. What this means is that they'll probably be okay, more or less, to, uh, to, to move their property and it very well might be insured. The problem is, is that there's tons of other people that are not as well off and that, that's what we refer to as vulnerable populations, is that uh, through a whole host of different reasons, primarily economic, but also uh, other social issues, is that someone it might be in a situation where they're living in a long-term home, maybe for uh, in an area f in, in their family for over a hundred years, as one woman discussed in the in the documentary, is that if, if she is forced to go, where can she go, and would she even be able to afford it? Probably a substantial amount of vulnerable persons' wealth is in their land if they have any, and the the class differences between these groups can be stark. One thing that they also talked about was climate gentrification. Uh, gentrification is uh, the process where uh, a, a wealthier set moves into a less wealthier area. Uh, this has been going on in the Tampa Bay area for decades, uh, if not the entire time that the Tampa Bay area has been around. But as you can imagine, uh, in Miami too, Liberty City, as the documentary went over, is one of those places. So if the, uh, the wealthy are displaced and that they need to be moved more inland or in areas above sea level, then that means that they are going to be moving into places or wanting to move into places where those vulnerable populations might already live. And in doing so, uh, they would be purchasing property and developing it and, and in turn making it more expensive to live. And so it, it, whether it's by the climate directly or by through climate gentrification, these vulnerable populations uh, are, can be significantly harmed in two different ways, no matter what happens, uh, wh whether their area is affected by sea level rise or not. So that leads us, I think, to talking about uh, our resilience measures. It, wh what do we then do with these populations? 
do we, uh, as one of the officials in the documentary stated, and I wrote it down to make sure that I got the exact uh, words right, was retreat is not an option. Is, so what this means is that there would be significant amount of people and money that will take aim at staying just exactly where they are. As the documentary discussed, that that could cost millions, if not billions of dollars. Uh, towards the end of the movie, they described how they raised the road, uh, I think it was 30 inches, and it took them uh, a year or two and millions of dollars, and it only covered a, a few blocks. And all of the disruption to the area that went along to it during that time that it took to do it. Uh, that it's a very expensive endeavor. Uh, but at the same time, what are the alternatives? Is if we're spending so much money to make sure that we can stay put in, whether it be Miami or Tampa Bay or any place else, uh, it, it's, we'd probably be spending a significant amount of money to move those populations. Um, if we were to, uh, the government or our population would assist them at all. So I think that what that question then leads to is, the, uh, is our ethical theory parts of all of this. What is the most ethical thing to do? We know we have the options. We know what's going to happen is that the, the climate change is causing sea level. We know it will happen. Uh, the, the debate is just how much. That means that what is the best policy to implement to, to help the citizens of, uh, of these areas and also make sure that it's done in a fair and just way. So two of the uh, ethical theories that come to mind for me when it comes to this, the conversation is utilitarianism and natural rights, and I'll define them in turn. Uh, utilitarianism is the ethical theory that dictates that the best action to take is whatever one that leads to the most happiness or the most good. There's many different ways to define happiness and good, of course, but it, it, that to apply utilitarianism in this case, we have to determine if we spend money in this area to maybe to uh, shore up uh, both literally and figuratively, I suppose, uh, our areas to develop uh, walls or mangroves in order to make sure that we can prevent uh, sea level rise, uh, how much money is that going to cost? And are we going to have to then use to get that money from increased taxes? And is that a worthwhile endeavor? On the other hand, maybe it might be a better option to uh, quote unquote displace populations and spend money in order to do that. Now, utilitarianism doesn't particularly care about whether that action is right or good, just as long as, if it, as it increases the happiness of as many people as possible to create a net benefit for as many people as possible. But the question is that, is that action right? And that what leads us, or in either of those actions for that matter, that leads us to natural rights. Natural rights to, dictates to us and uh, brought to us primarily, in, at least in America, by uh, John Locke, and is heavily influenced a lot of the policy and legal development uh, over the course of past two, several hundred years in the United States, is that the tradition of maintaining rights, is that the primary right that comes to mind that everybody thinks of is the right to liberty, is that if we have the right to live where we want to live, does, does other people then have then an obligation to support our, our desire and right to do that? So then that leads us to a couple other rights, with the welfare rights and security rights. If we have the right to be secure, to be safe, how does the government then maintain that security? Or on the other hand, maybe that we have the, op the obligation to maintain that ourselves, to protect ourselves uh, individually. And if that means individually, then maybe we individually need to take ourselves and leave from these vulnerable areas. But at the same time, we also have the right to welfare. And that's often referred to as a positive right means that we owe that to other people. So if we owe uh, uh, an area, a safe place to live, an education, uh, the, to, the right to not be starving or uh, the right to have an education, maybe the best way to do that is to make, stay put in Miami and, or Tampa Bay or any place else in order to maintain those rights as best as we can. These, these rights and obligations that we have, but also that we owe to each other. I think that it's, it's such a big conversation that uh, I, I think that we can now have with our panelists. So I think that leads us, uh, Dr. Jackson, with your leave, uh, to uh, our Q&A. 
Um, yes, so, yes um, that was very wonderful, just robust discussion as I had envisioned. And if you look at the Q and A, it is lit up. So uh, uh, we we're blowing many, up. All right, <laughs> it's blown up. <laughs> you have cool. many questions that you're going to have to answer now. I want to remind the panelists, the uh, the audience, that we're going to do our best to answer all of your questions. Uh, you can email us all all of us at the end if that's helpful. If you still have questions. And we're going to let Christian take a stab at it at this time, Professor Moriarty. Sure. And you can do an at symbol if you have a specific question to a specific panelist. I think that will help the flow of the conversation. Also, for those of you all who had some challenges in the beginning with Wi-Fi or structural challenges, again, it is pouring behind me. So I hope that you're able to um, access this video. We will have it entirely recorded, digitized with closed caption. So as soon as we have that, it'll be posted on our websites and given to all the panelists and the professors, particularly the public policy department. And with that, Christian, Professor Moray, I have to, I have to keep remembering that. <laughs> <laughs> Christian's just fine. So uh, I, I, first question I think here, and it, it's just something that's on everybody's mind, and I appreciate the question. Thank you, Elena. Uh, would you expect to see resilience plans and funds change now that we are facing economic changes and challenges because of COVID-19, um, uh, probably, and I'm sure that's, uh, we just can't get away from that. I'm sure that's on everybody's mind. Uh, panelists, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and so effectively, it's all about the prioritization of the, the local government and what they respond to is what their constituents are saying. And so I think this will be a localized discussion as we look forward into the future is, you know, over the next several months, um, we're dealing with the impacts of COVID-19 and their significant um, economic impacts that, that could potentially, who knows, set off a recession. With that said, we're talking, you know, 40, 50 year plans that we're working towards. And so I think it might cause a slowdown, but maybe not the size and magnitude of the planning that will go on. So, uh, Dr. Passeri, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I agree. Um, you know, the seas are still going to be rising. And like Patrick said, this is something these plans look out for the next 40, 50 years. So I think that this is still going to be a relevant issue that everyone's going to be working towards to address. And I think since there's so much concentration on alleviating the effects of COVID-19, um, it seems like just some things are just going to have to take a back seat for now. Uh, I mean, at the same time, humans and are, are capable of multitasking. So uh, my hope is that we'll continue on this, but it, it's, it's just... We'll, we'll do, I think, we'll best we can uh, as we can. Um, there was a, a good question that came in here, and uh, Dr. Passeri, I think this one's particularly pointed to you. Um, it, video talked about preserving mangroves or more natural things because they cost less and they're more beneficial uh, long term. Um, is, is that just the solution? I mean, we're talking about a lot of more expensive things. Um, should we just be concentrating on those mangroves, or is, the, is there something more to it than that? Well, as I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of issues with these hard structures like seawalls and jetties and breakwaters, um, a lot of disadvantages with how they can cause more erosion to nearby areas. So like I said, there is this push to go with these natural features like mangroves and marshes to help dampen wave energy and reduce storm surge inundation. Um, unfortunately, it's not just that simple as to put them everywhere, you know, somewhere like Miami, no one wants to have a mangrove in front of their beach. So that's gonna have effects for tourism. But I think um, in the future, the way to go is to kind of aim towards these hybrid approaches of using these natural features, but still combining them with the existing infrastructure that we have. So there's a lot of research that still needs to be done on it, but I think we do have to look back at nature to see how we can mitigate the effects of sea level rise. And uh, Professor, is that, do you, do you agree? I mean, how are we looking at making sure that we have a holistic approach? Yeah, no, so landscape architecture has really become a very important piece of uh, resiliency planning because it is using natural land features to help us prevent uh, a lot of the, the stormwater uh, 
sea level rise that's going on. Uh, and it goes back to this idea that we want to make sure that what we're targeting when we size our resiliency strategy are our best bang for bucks from an economic standpoint. And effectively, we do get diminishing returns by, you know, stacking more and more mangroves. But I would suspect we wouldn't have as much effectiveness uh, as we add more and more and more uh, mangroves to it. So we want to continue to make sure that as we come up with our plan, it is a holistic approach that looks at all available resources and comes up with the cost benefit nexus. There was one question that I, it just that came in that really stuck out at me and that I just love is that uh, if the ethical choice is more likely to fail, should we still do it? Um, so it, it's such a good question and that uh, an ethics professor like myself just loves answering. Um, I'm looking at Dr. Jackson laughing at me already because this is a question that's directly up my alley. Uh, is I mean that that is the question I suppose. It's like my tendency for all these kinds of questions is that whoever asked it to say, well, what do you think? But can't do that here. So um, I, I think under these situations that if, depending on which ethical theory you're using or, or combination or what have you, is that it really depends uh, if you think that the most ethical option is not going to work, is that still the most ethical option? So we then have to address the politics with all of this too is that if we say this is the best policy, but we know it will never get past the legislature or that, that we'll never get the money for it or uh, the judiciary will overturn it, is that really the best option? We can try to convince people towards a side and t take efforts to uh, alleviate those issues. But if we run into that roadblock, we need to then consider if it's not a legitimate answer, then maybe it's not the most ethical answer. Uh, I, I hope that answered your question. I think I just answered a question with more questions, but that's usually how I roll. Um, uh, uh, professor, there was another one that came in that I thought was really good that I, I, I had like half this thought and one of our uh, viewers uh, the, articulated it perfectly for me. Um, uh, Juliana brought this to us. How do we motivate the free riders and preve either prevent them from freeloading or stop them from freeloading? Yeah, and this is fundamental to why, you know, the oversight and provision of you know, these resiliency plans are held at the government level. Uh, they have a process in place to make sure that free riders are no longer able to ride free. They get a bill, whether it's on their taxes, whether it's a utility bill in the mail, that's done by a component of these studies to handle the financial element of funding these plans. And they go ahead and look at all of the constituents, all of the properties within a local area and understand how are these properties impacted by sea level rise. And we're going to take all the costs that we're putting into helping us abate those negative consequences. And we're going to take those costs and allocate them to those who benefit. And so those free riders are no longer able to ride free because it's either their property tax that's going to receive a bill or a non avalorum assessment or a utility bill that they're going to get in the mail. And that leads us to further, I think, political conversation and policy that goes along with it. Um, uh, Dr. Berseri, one that came in that w I thought was useful, that particularly to our viewers uh, tuning in with us, is that um, are you familiar with the Pinellas County Resilience Plans? And can you maybe help flush that out? Um, so I can't speak too specifically to the Pinellas County Resilience Plans. I can say that I sit on the Tampa Bay Climate Science Advisory Panel which is made up of a group of local scientists and also um, local and regional planners. And that was the report that I had mentioned um, was put out last year regarding recommendations for which sea level rise projections to consider for future planning purposes. So sea level rise is a topic that um, Pinellas County and Hillsborough County are both thinking about actively. And I know that there are strategies being put in place for our region. Thank you. Uh, there, a, lot, there, a lot of these questions that are coming in are, well, I really think uh, caught fire with people discussing utilitarianism and uh, differentiating that. So one question that came in was to differentiate act and rule utilitarianism uh, that some of our ethics students that are joining us are asking about. Act utilitarianism is looking at what acts leads us to the best results, the most happiness. Then rule utilitarianism 
is asking us if we were to implement a rule uh, and everybody followed that rule, would that create the most happiness as compared to other rules that other people might follow? So, and then one of the questions that came along with that too is then, okay, so is utilitarianism an effective way of doing this? So I think I kind of want to open this up to the panel. Um, do you folks think to maybe to reduce uh, the free rider problem uh, or to help make sure that everybody is getting engaged with this, that maybe some sort of mandate is the right answer to this. Um, both to Dr. Passeri, do we get more people involved in, in, in enforcing some of these uh, measures to prevent further damage? And uh, Professor, do you think that we are, not only are we capable of doing that, but uh, it, it, would that be effective and would that be an economical way of going about it? So I think, um, you know, first, we really need to educate the general public on what the issue is and what it means specifically for our region. Um, and so we can do this by various engagement. Um, this is a perfect example of it, just talking about the issues related to sea level rise and what it means for Tampa Bay. Um, so it really starts with this education. And from the science perspective, you know, Scientists sometimes just like to get into their little bubble and do cool science, but we have to make sure that our science can be translatable to um, people, to decision makers. So we need to engage with stakeholders and coastal managers and end users to find out specifically what their needs are and what kind of information they need from the science perspective. And to kind of jump right off of that, uh, educational and community outreach is, is vital to this process because effectively these decisions are being made in the local government forum. And so your elected officials will hear you, right? And, and what it is that you benefit from. And so effectively, if there is a, a sentiment within the local economy that they are not willing to pay for these improvements to be made to their city or town or county, then these measures aren't going to get passed in the political set forum. And so there's that whole realm that we need to be concerned with and we need to make sure that uh, we have great educational outreach and we're well informed and we have the, the tools at our disposal to make decisions. Uh, and I'd like to jump in yeah, real please. quick if I can and then just take a, have the panelists take a moment to look at the questions. Since we are about 15 minutes towards the end, I want to make sure if you all can type in answers, if there's something directed at you, please do so. But what you just said about being well-informed, I was writing uh, issues and questions to address as we wrapped up for the very end, but it was appropriate to discuss them now. Being well-informed is the entire key. Understanding when you ask many people, not everyone, um, who their local leaders are who are making these decisions, um, what they're understanding about very micro issues that they should, that impact their dollar, their everyday tax assessments, and how is divided in terms of the equity perspective on a community level, then that answers the ethical question of why and how. Um, from a pragmatic standpoint to say, un understanding ethical issues requires that someone have less for someone else to have more. And scarcity is a challenge when it's not met with, as Dr. Prasari so appropriately said, translating issues into something that we can all touch, feel, and understand. So being active, and then finally going to back to what Professor Moriarty said about what is the most ethical issue if you push for advocacy, but at the end it's not ultimately um, it doesn't memorialize into policy that's meaningful, um, that we all understand and we all take a stake in. So those are all challenges that we have. And one of the final issues I wanted to address is, we selected this movie after looking at many, many documentaries. <laughs> this was the most close, not because we can solve the issues for Miami, but the Pinellas area is a growth model right now. Um, we have grown exponentially in the past 10 years. We are facing challenges related to sea level rise and resiliency. So I would ask you to ask yourselves, how many of us know what our planners are doing and how that equates and impacts us on a daily basis when we have any uh, 
issues with instability to, to address the COVID-19 issue. So I hope that gave my panelists a little break so they can catch up. It <laughs> <laughs> was too short. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no problem. So uh, one, th the one that came in uh, is the, I, I, I want to open this one up to the panel too, is that sh should stop, should banks or maybe even, our go I'm adding this part, the government uh, stop people from buying property on sea level areas? Uh, th this one's asking you to get into an opinion. Uh, I hope that's not asking too much. Uh, what, what do you think? Should, should there be some sort of policy to stop people from continuing to build and live here? I think it's definitely something that needs to be considered. And actually, I think there are a couple areas that have started to consider this. Um, I heard, and I'm not completely positive on this, but after Hurricane Irma came through and hit the Keys, um, there were a couple houses uh, I think it was maybe in Key Largo, Key Largo that were just completely devastated. And so I heard that the local government started buying up that property to prevent people from rebuilding. Um, I believe also Louisiana that there's a couple areas like that too, um, due to the sea level rise, rapidly rising there. So it's definitely something that we need to talk about. These areas that are prone to increase inundation not just from storm events, but from sea level rise as well. You know, we can't just keep building houses right back on top. We're gonna to need to do something different in the future. Professor, what do you think? I think this is a very loaded question. Um, <laughs> Good, <laughs> yes. I'm happy it, about that. It, it is making me dance back and forth in my mind uh, because the, the champion of economics that I am, I would say, well, the free market will solve that problem. There's no inherent market failure in the, the housing sector uh, on coastal areas. There's a decision-making process that exists, right? So effectively, I'm taking the risk when I buy that house. The bank is taking the risk when they make that loan. The insurance company is taking the risk when they size your insurance premium. And this is all factored into that decision-making process. And if the cities continue to, you know, engage in resiliency planning and do the measures that protect those properties, then we may not have the issues down the road that we're forecasting and foreseeing. Now, with that said, what are the economic effects if we neglect and we allow uh, a market to continue to uh, um, not learn from its mistakes? Because that's potentially what we may allow. And so this is not a answer but more of me thinking out loud and responding that I, I don't have the data in, in front of me to say whether or not uh, this would prov produce the desired results because that's what we're always very concerned with when we get the government involved in free markets and the private sector is they may be very well intended but they may not produce the desired results. And so I don't have research or backing to prove that. So I'm cautioning it. And, and I think that leads us to, uh, we had a few questions that came in about uh, climate gentrification. Um, I mean, it, the, one of the first co questions that come from this is that is preventing gentrification even, I mean, there's all the legal issues, but also more importantly, the ethical issues. Uh, is preventing gentrification ethical? Now, uh, you can certainly take it from the, the natural rights perspective is that someone has uh, the liberty and the security to wanting to live in the area that they come from. Uh, that natural rights pretty squarely puts the, some sort of a prevention measure to, to protect that, those individual liberties. Um, but utilitarianism might, might come in and have a different de de decision is that if it helps the majority to, to allow gentrification, then it according to the theory, it would need to happen if it were to be to choose a more moral option. Um, so I, I guess the question then becomes, okay, so let's say that we want to look at a policy of preventing gentrification, maybe not completely because that may not be politically tenable, but some sort of way of maintaining 
uh, uh, the rights of the indigenous populations or the populations that have lived there for a significant period of time, while also maintaining uh, affordable housing, while also making sure that economic development can continue and uh, th that to benefit for as many people as possible. So uh, I guess the, <laughs> I, sorry, I keep asking questions and I'm not answering any. Uh, so the, the answer is, what do you think is politically tenable? So um, under our current circumstances, particularly in Florida, uh, I, I have to wonder. Um, so, I mean, you, you've probably seen, if you've spent any degree of time in Florida at all, you see uh, gentrification that's going on around us all the time. Um, and that will just be exacerbated by, uh, by climate gentrification. Of course, then we then uh, rear the ugly head of, of redlining that, that may come along with that, is that we constantly keep moving our vulnerable populations into and farther away and farther away areas. Um, the uh, San Francisco is dealing with this issue significantly, and it's not even climate gentrification, is that the people that actually work in the city, blue collar jobs, uh, live hours away because they have to, because they can't afford to live there. I don't think Miami or Tampa for that matter is terribly far from that. So then what's the answer? And the answer to that is, well, what do you think is politically tenable, I guess? So, all right. So uh, we got a question from Virginia uh, about the economic impact about, uh, Dr. Passeri, you talked about these uh, hybrid approaches uh, of, of solving this. And I think for the professor after would be a good answer to this too. It, do you think this is a good solution, that this hybrid solution? Um, and is it economically feasible? And do you think we can get people on board? Yes, and it's actually something that a lot of communities are already thinking about. Um, I have been involved in quite a few restoration assessments at this point um, in the Gulf of Mexico, where states are looking at these hybrid approaches of creating what they call living shorelines. So this could be the oyster reef restoration or actually putting sand back to recreate islands to help mitigate um, wave energy and storm surge inundation. So it's definitely something that we are currently researching and it's something that there is money to actually act and build towards. Um, of course, you know, we need to keep doing more research and it's very site specific. So you need to have these local and regional studies to assess the impacts properly. And effectively, it, it, it just brings home that these decisions really are made at the local level, right? What's right for Miami may not be what's right for St. Petersburg. And that's why we need to do these analyses. That's why we need to plan. That's why we need to think. And even if the exact same response measures would be the same, have the same level of impact, uh, the local residents may have differing thinking or opinions on what is uh, tenable. And effectively, what we want to make sure is that there is outreach, there is engagement that takes all of this planning, all of these studies, all of this science, and it packages them something, packages them, packages them into something that is uh, palatable that people can understand and appreciate and can reason with and give us great insight when we get into the the public sector and the public realm and how we get initiatives and capital spending and master plans passed approved and paid for as so we, as yeah, we please the, well we're coming to the end unfortunately and i wanted to have you each of you all have final thoughts reflections and what you'd like to part with um, our audience, um, keeping in mind that some are students and some are community members, and we've had um, about 170 participants. So, of course, it'd be challenging to eat, get to all of your questions, but you've raised some very important issues, and I want to give you the opportunity, even though we're going to run over about five minutes to do so, to get, give everyone um, a chance to have final thoughts on this issue. Dr. Perseri, let's start with you. Sure. Um, again, I just want to say thank you for organizing this. I think that this has been a great venue to discuss the topic of sea level rise and particularly what it means for our region. You know, we need to have more engagement like this and we need to keep talking about the issue and educating ourselves. So thank you all for tuning into this and I really encourage you to keep educating yourself on the issue. 
Um, the USGS, the US Geological Survey, where I work, is right here in St. Pete. And so we are currently doing a lot of research on this topic and trying to figure out ways that we can translate our science into actionable information. Thank you again. That's all I have. Professor Luce? And uh, my, my sentiment is very similar. Learn, right? Continue to learn about your local environment. Continue learning about your local government and us. We, we are the ones that can help impact our own quality of life and standard of living through being active, through learning, through engaging and understanding what's going on around us. And this, it, it happens everywhere, right? And I love economics, so I relate everything back to that. Economics is everything that we do. Everything in our lives is a decision-making process. And we're constantly weighing out costs and benefits and learning about everything at your disposal, right? And you can go on to USGS and find all the science behind all this. And you can go on to all of your local government websites and find information in regards to what they're doing, their different community outreaches and the public meetings where you can have a voice and help impact our change and then progress forward. I, it's you, you all just exactly the same. We're all on the same page on this. Uh, there was one question that came in that I was hoping to say for the end, and this is sure. perfect, uh, is that, um, at, uh, what was it, uh, David Petty asked, uh, at what point do we say it's too late? Um, we're spending a lot of time, energy, and money, uh, and, and human lives to a certain extent on trying to alleviate these issues, and we're not even convincing everybody towards, uh, towards those positions, is that not everybody <laughs> even believes that it's happening. Um, so... Uh, do, at what point is it, are we now at a point where it's too late and there's nothing we can do? Uh, it, it's, it, and then as David points out, is that maybe we need to start thinking about even more significant contingencies. Now, to answer the first question, no, I, I don't, personally at least, I don't think it's ever too late. But as your second point is very relevant, is that we might have to get to more significant and possibly more extreme measures in order to, to solve these problems, because these problems are very real. And to, to echo uh, uh, my fellow panelists on this is that I, I argue uh, I'm going to actually state an opinion. Amazing uh, is that that we have an ethical obligation towards not only educating ourselves on this, but educating others too. Is that as a citizen of a democracy, one of the few responsibilities that come with that, besides uh, paying your taxes and uh, going to jury duty is that to, to vote and make your voice heard and to help other people do the same. So it, it, these are important issues. And if, if sit, whole cities are gonna be underwater, we need to help address that. And the sooner, the better. So if we can get together, help educate ourselves and help educate others along the same way of the importance of this. And may, we may not ever agree on what is the most ethical solution or the most politically tenable solution. But we can find a compromise. We can find a, a middle ground. And that is certainly better than doing nothing. And I encourage you, uh, everybody listening today to try to do the same. So I, I appreciate all, all of your time and questions. Sorry I couldn't get to all of them. There were so many good questions. And uh, uh, be safe out there. Well, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you to each of you all for joining us, for giving us your time, for sharing your wisdom. And I would echo the most important part of all of this is continuing the conversation. We are not going to agree. As human beings, we rarely do. But it is important to listen. It's an active skill that is so important as we continue to make our footprints known. We have to be responsible in how we interact with each other. And having a conversation is always a first step. I'd like to thank you again for joining the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions, ISPS. We've done some really great programming this month and we hope to continue to do so. On Friday, we're having a program with nonprofit leaders, the executive directors of the St. Pete Free Clinic, the YMCA, the JWB and the Pinellas Community Foundation on how they're stepping in to deal with the gap of services in light of COVID-19 to help our community. If you know of anyone who is challenged in any way and could have benefit from this, please share that Zoom link. You can go to solutions.sbcollege.edu. But also, as you all brought these really wonderful questions, please continue to bring them. We'll do our best to post information on our website and we'll ask our panelists to give resources that we can utilize after this program. Again, thank you for your time. 
We actually finished on time, even with closing. So it's wonderful. It's 6.30. Again, my very thanks to the panelists, our exceptional um, technology team, Kyle Bell, and the ISPS team, Jacqueline Shewitt and Sharon Panov, of whom which we could not do these programs. Thank you and have a great evening. <laughs>